Hello and welcome to another video. In this one, we're going to be talking about how I saved a terabyte of RAM. Which is just an unfathomable amount. Uh, in production at work, uh, using just a single line of code. I mean, there's a few other lines around it, but one line of code that was important. Uh, anyway, let's jump into it. First, I wanted to show you some graphs just to give you an idea of how I monitored this after the fact to show the impact of this change. Uh, the first is the total amount of memory for all workers at at uh, Sentry. Uh, these spikes are every time we deploy, we scale up a bunch of workers to replace the old ones, and so kind of ignore the spikes there. Um, you can see that it, it, that it basically goes from around 2.8-ish to 1.8-ish. A, a whole, well, it's a tebabyte here, but <laughs> tebabytes, terabytes, basically the same thing. Um, and if we look at an individual worker, you can see kind of a similar effect here. Uh, these swoops are every time it restarts. Uh, and you can see here that um, this baseline up here at about three and a half gigabytes uh, down to about two and a half gigabytes here. Uh, and this is for just a particular worker, not, not all of the workers. Anyway, that's the impact of this change. I wanted to go over how I did this and what that line of code is. Uh, spoilers, that line of code is gc.freeze. Uh, I did a video on fork versus exec, which goes over a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about here, but I'm going to give you kind of a TLDR of how fork works and how uh, copy on write memory, it can be saved. Uh, this All of the savings here is from copy on write. Um, so basically the way fork works is you start a parent process and you allocate all sorts of memory in it. Uh, let's actually represent memory as a bunch of blocks. Uh, these blocks are, you can call them pages or whatever. Um, but we start a parent process and then we fork off a bunch of separate workers. Uh, I'm just gonna fork two workers because drawing all 16 that is typical of the ones at Sentry is gonna be a lot of work. Um, so let's say that this is the uh, parent process and this is going to fork off two children. Uh, and so they basically get created. In a fork, uh, the child processes inherit their, inherit their parent memory. And so basically all of the memory that was allocated in the parent process is available in the child process. However, that, allocate, that allocated memory is not resident, it's not present, it's not you know something that that process directly owns until a write occurs. And so when we spawn these processes, by default, they don't take up any resident memory. I mean, they take a little bit of resident memory because of the program that's running and whatever code that immediately runs, um, but they don't inherit the resident memory of the parent process. Uh, pages are only resident when they are written to. This is what copy on write is. So if, you, if this process wrote to some variable that was on this page, uh, suddenly it would get a, oops, keep that. Uh, suddenly it would get a new copy of that page copied over here um, because a write occurred. And so now this page becomes resident. That's the basic idea. That's the basic optimization of copy on write in that you can save a bunch of memory if you don't perform writes on the memory. Now, uh, why does this gc.freeze make a big difference in copy on write? And so the answer to that uh, has to do with how Python manages all of its objects. Um, and I'm gonna give a very simplified version of that, and then we're gonna talk more specifically about optimizations that I could further do with gc.freeze, and also why it is so successful in this case. All right, so the basic way that Python works is every object is a pi object star, and that is a struct, if we do git grept, I know it's a type def uh, to, and I hope this works. Object star, okay, cool. This is probably garbage. This is probably what we actually care about. Okay, so somewhere there is struct object, get grip this, uh, object.h, okay. Struct object, I think I've shown this on stream or on, on video before. Um, but basically every object in Python is one of these pi object stars or this struct object. And inside this object is basically a ref count and then a pointer to its type. Uh, and then further data can happen later in there. It's kind of inheritance via 
pointer punning stuff. Uh, but the important part here is the reference count. Every object in Python has this little reference count field. And, uh, or it's ref count split, but you can, it's reference count. Uh, so any variable that has a reference count basically has this number in here. If something else refers to it, this number increases. If something stops referring to it, that number decreases. With me so far? Uh, if this falls to zero, it gets deallocated. Uh, and so that's kind of how the object lifecycle works in Python. Python also has a garbage collector, a garbage collector, uh, which allows it to garbage collect circular references. So like if A refers to B and B refers to A, in a traditional reference counting system, those will both have a positive ref count, uh, at least one, because they refer to each other. Um, and if you didn't have a circular garbage collector, those objects would live forever. They would leak and, and not be garbage collected. So you need a garbage collector or some other similar system to notice that, oh yeah, nothing refers into that cycle, and so we can collect the whole thing. And during garbage collection, uh, an object may get its reference count increased or decreased, and so the garbage collector needs to hold a reference to those objects before killing them. And so basically what happens is in a normal Python process, the garbage collector is going to look over every object that exists and twiddle these reference count bits, uh, increasing or decreasing them, bytes, you know, integers. Uh, as it garbage collects things, it's going to modify these variables. And you'll note from before, if we perform modification, it's going to get copied into resident memory in the child process. And so... Uh, basically, a side effect of the garbage collector is going to page in all of the memory of the Python, Python process, which is what we wanted to avoid in the first place. Like most of the benefit of fork is that you don't have to copy over a bunch of memory because it's you know read only. We're not modifying it. Unfortunately, Python suffers from having reference counts on the object, and so anytime you modify them, you're going to page the objects in. Uh, you could, of course, move the reference counts to some reserved field, and then you'd have another layer of indirection, and then you'd have more memory because the object counts would be over there, and so you kind of lose some of the benefits there. Anyway, I'm not going <laughs> to redesign how Python works. That's just how it works. So the problem is that these reference counts get modified, and these objects get paged in. And so how can we avoid that? Uh, and that's when GC freeze comes along. This was actually an innovation by Instagram, and it landed in Python 3.7. So if you're in a similar situation, you can also take advantage of this. Um, Instagram does a crazy thing in their pre-fork where they completely disable garbage collector. Uh, actually, I think they completely disable the garbage collector in general. They just don't run it at all. Um, but GC freeze, what it does is it takes all of the existing objects at this point in the process, right before you're going to fork, and it puts them into a permanent garbage collection generation. Uh, the permanent generation is one that just doesn't participate in garbage collection. Those objects will very unlikely be collected anyway because they're probably just modules and functions, etc. Those will get torn down when the process gets torn down. And everything else is, you know, everything after that is probably useful to do garbage collection on. But everything that exists before you fork, probably not important. Probably never going to change. Probably never going to get garbage collected. So we don't really need to worry about iterating through it, looking for cycles, updating those reference counts and paging in those objects. Um, and so that's what GC free do freeze does. It takes those objects, puts them into permanent uh, garbage collection generation, and so they don't participate in garbage collection after that. Um, now there are some notes in the docs on this on further improvements here. I didn't do the further improvements because uh, when I played with it locally, it made very little to no difference. Um, but uh, what GC freeze uh, has problems with is if objects are allocated uh, and leave spaces. So the way Python's default allocator works is it tries to optimize for a bunch of small objects. Because typically, Python is a bunch of you know, like integers or strings or small itty bitty objects and not very large buffers. And so Python has a block allocator. Basically, what the block allocator does is it tries to fill in these small objects in larger contiguous blocks. Uh, I don't remember whether they are specifically page sized or not, but that's not important for this. And so Python will try and, oh, that one's the wrong color. 
uh, try and fill in blocks with objects as it allocates them. Uh, let's see that those are lined up. Um, and you know, basically try and fill a block continuously. Uh, if an object is freed, for instance, if, uh, you know, let's say that, uh, brush, sure. Let's say that this one got freed. Uh, Python will then try and fill that object in later with a future allocation instead of trying to make a new block. So we might get a brand new object that fills in this same space here. Um, and so with Python's block allocator, uh, if you allow the garbage collector to run before you freeze things, uh, it may create holes inside your pages. And uh, that would allow a future Python process to allocate an object and it'll bring in this whole block. It'll page in this whole block, which is what we wanted to avoid in copy on write anyway. Uh, in, in my experience, when trying this out locally and on Sentry, it didn't make a difference. Uh, there were holes in, in blocks, whether or not I freeze the process at the beginning. Uh, I suspect some of these are from reference counts falling to zero and objects being freed naturally without garbage collection. And so there was still, you know, holes in the, in the uh, Python allocated blocks. But also, uh, in general, I noticed that there weren't that many holes and most of the blocks were pretty contiguous. So I didn't bother with the more advanced, um, you know, more aggressive garbage collection disabling and re-enabling, uh, which is recommended by the docs. This was good enough. Um, the idea behind disabling the garbage collector is you wouldn't have these freed blocks and you'd have more contiguous permanent, uh, you know, Python allocated blocks. So you would have more of these pages that never get paged in. Or more of these arenas is what they call them in Python, never getting paged in. Uh, page being an operating system page and arena being the PyMalloc block. It's all kind of confusing, but the basic idea is it's copy and write, go burr. Um, but yeah, I was I was pretty excited about this. Uh, I originally made this commit just to try it try it out and see what would happen. And most of this analysis and you know the contents of this video are things that I uh, sort of learned after this. I've known a lot about GC GC.freeze in the past. Uh, I believe Yelp used this and actually backported this to Python two back in the day to optimize a bunch of pre-fork workers there. Um, and I've dabbled with it in a few cases uh, at for, uh, past companies. But anyway, pretty pretty significant impact. Um, this is, you know, <laughs> gonna make a big difference on uh, Sentry's bottom line, which is kind of cool. Uh, but anyway, that's GC Freeze. Uh, a little bit about fork and copy and write and the Python allocator and reference counts and garbage collection and all that other stuff. I hope you found this useful. If there are additional things you would like me to explain, leave a comment below or reach out to me on the various platforms. But thank you all for watching and I will see you in the next one.